The last gospel lesson which we read this morning is from the first chapter of the gospel according to John. It is called the prologue because it sets the stage for the rest of the story of Jesus' earthly life. It begins with these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning. We've heard those words somewhere before. You know as well as I where it is that we've heard those in the beginning words. They come from the opening sentences of the book of Genesis. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. It seems to me that even before he gets into telling the story of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection, John the Evangelist is telling us something very profound. And he starts doing that with the first three words that he wrote. The words, in the beginning, obviously speak to us of something new, something fresh, something which hasn't happened before, something in which anything and everything is possible because there is nothing old, nothing broken, nothing worn out, and nothing corrupt to stand in its way. That was the Genesis vision of the creation in the beginning. While it was still fresh and new, before sin and selfishness began to disfigure, corrupt, and to destroy the fact that John chose these same three words to begin his gospel cannot be a coincidence. John is telling us that just as God in the beginning was doing something new in creation, so too is God doing something new in what we call the incarnation, the coming of Christ as one of us. As you know, each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us essentially the same story, the story of Jesus. Yet we also know that each of the evangelists, the Gospel writers, had their own unique perspectives in telling that story. We could go on at great length and into great detail about those Gospels and about the perspectives which shaped them. But that's more the stuff of a Bible study and a fairly lengthy one at that than it is for a Sunday homily. Suffice it to say that while all of the Gospel writers were both storytellers and theologians, John's Gospel stands apart from the others. John is a theologian first and foremost, and he seeks to look for the deeper meaning. And during the Christmas season, John may seem to, to us to be something of a disappointment. He's not concerned with the events surrounding Jesus' birth. He isn't concerned with singing angels or awestruck shepherds or the fact that there was no place for the Holy Family at the inn. John's focus is cosmic. John wants us to understand that the events in Bethlehem which began our Christmas celebration a week ago are like the creation story of Genesis. They mark the beginning of something new. John tells us that the Word of God, the person we call Jesus, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who has always existed and through whom all the creation of the world and the universe were accomplished, became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the Word, became one of us not just for the Christmas season, not just for the 33 years of his earthly life, but he became one of us forever. As one commentator has said, through the incarnation, Jesus became one of us so that we could see, hear, and touch the living Word of God and partake of the divine fullness. St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Galatians that when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, so that we might receive adoption as children. 
Through the incarnation, we are no longer strangers or servants, but have become the children of God through the waters of baptism, and have become each of us sisters and brothers of Christ and of each other. We have become children of God and co-heirs with Jesus to his and to our Father's kingdom. And it is that kingdom, God's kingdom, breaking into our world that is making all things new. By virtue of our baptism into Christ, we are his visible presence in this world. We are called to be the hands and the feet and the eyes of Christ, active, alive, and working in the world. The gospel, the good news, whether according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, is, as we know, almost 2,000 years old. So a reasonable person could certainly ask, how and in what way is any of this really new? My answer to that is really very simple. The ways of this world, the ways of destruction, the ways of greed, the ways of corruption, the ways of hatred and violence, in short, the ways of sin and death, continue as they have since the fall. And frankly, folks, they're getting really old. God made us for something much better than that. And he has placed in our hearts a real and an urgent desire for something, something better, something good, something true, something beautiful, something lasting. And after so much disappointment, so much heartbreak with the ways and values of this world, yes, there is a real desire for something new. The coming of God's kingdom seems to take a long time, but that's not so much God's fault as it is ours. Yet his kingdom continues to come, and when it breaks into our lives and into our world, it is ever and always new, because it stands the lies and the false values of this world on its head, and in so doing, it brings redemption and life, healing, forgiveness, peace and truth, faith, trust, joy, and love. And flowing from all of them is a real and a lasting hope. And you know, those things just never get old. To God be the glory now and forever. Amen.